Well, good morning, LU. It's so good to see you guys this morning. Uh, my name is Shondisa Jones, and I am the newest, the newest addition to the Shepherd's Office, or the Baby Shepherd, as I like to call myself. Is anybody here from the Annex, or the Hill, or Dorm 7? Hey, y'all. <laughs> So I am just here to talk about the amazing to work for the Shepherd's Office. You guys, uh, we are here to walk alongside you, to do life with you, uh, to pray with you, to minister to you, and just to love on the student body at large. And so more than anything, guys, we're just here to serve you all. And so we are located over at Dorm 17. Uh, we are open from 8 to 5, Monday through Friday. Um, and the, if you look at the slide, you'll see all of our contact information. And then immediately following this convo, uh, we'll have LU Shepherds here at the front just to pray with you and to love on you and just to minister to your needs. So please come and see us at the Shepherd's office. We would love to see you guys there. Um, and so, yeah, please do that. And bigger than that, um, who is excited about Christmas Coffee House tomorrow? Who's going? <laughs> Yeah, y'all look excited. That's good. Okay, so Christmas Coffee House is going to be is going to be tomorrow here at the Vines at 11:30 p.m. You guys do not want to miss it. You can get your tickets after Convo today. Um, the ticket box office will be opening immediately after Convo, so please go get those tickets. The prices go up today, guys. So if you don't get them today, you're gonna pay full price, and we're all on a college budget, so we don't want to do that. So make sure you go and get your tickets today for Christmas Coffee House. Um, you can also get them online, and make sure that you guys are. In the place tomorrow night. Cool? All right. So I am absolutely delighted this morning, guys, to introduce to you um, our guest speaker, Dr. Rosaria Butterfield. Um, Dr. Butterfield earned her PhD from Ohio State University and then became, oh, okay. All right. And then became a tenured professor of English uh, and a women's studies professor at Syracuse University. In 1999, uh, she surrendered her life to Jesus, you all. She has an amazing testimony, and she's going to tell us all about that um, when she comes up. Her, uh, that's chronicled in her memoir, uh, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, and it'll tell that story. She has a new book out, and it's called Openness Unhindered, and it's available at the bookstore, so you guys can go get that. Um, she is married to Kent. He's a Reformed Presbyterian pastor. She's a home school teacher, a mother, an author, and a speaker, and she resides in North Carolina. I know North Carolina's in here. Yeah. And she loves dogs, and she loves coffee. And so if you guys would join me in giving a warm welcome to our wonderful speaker this morning, Dr. Rosaria Butterfield. Thank you. Ah, thank you. <sighs> I spent much of my young adult life in serially monogamous lesbian relationships, identifying exclusively as a lesbian for 10 years. During those years, I also worked hard to advance LGBT rights. The world we live in now is the one I helped create, the one with constitutional rights for gay marriage and abortion. That's my world. I am the face of the new sexual morality. The blood is on my hands. I have never hated men. I even dated men. And always, when I was publicly dating men, I was privately falling in love with women. At 28, I met my first lesbian lover, and life finally came together for me and made sense. My life as a lesbian seemed normal. I considered it an enlightened, chosen path. Lesbianism felt cleaner and more moral to me. Always preferring symmetry to asymmetry, I believed I had found my real self. And the name Jesus, which had rolled off my tongue in a little girl's prayers, and then rolled off my back in college, now made me recoil with anger. As a professor of English and women's studies, I tired of students who believed that knowing Jesus meant knowing little else. Christians seemed like bad readers to me, ironic, I thought, given that, that, that we believe that the Bible is the true truth. You see, Christians used the Bible in a way that Marxists call vulgar, to end a conversation rather than to deepen it. But the most frustrating thing to me about Christians is that they simply would not leave consenting adults alone. 
I cared about morality, justice, and compassion. As a 19th century scholar fervent for the worldviews of Freud, Hegel, Marx, and Darwin, I strove to stand with the disempowered. And my life at the time was happy and meaningful and full. My partner and I shared many vital interests, AIDS activism, children's health and literacy, golden retriever rescue, our Unitarian Universalist Church, just to name a few. It was hard to argue that she and I were anything but good citizens and good caregivers. The LGBTQ community values hospitality and applies it with skill and sacrifice and integrity. And indeed, I honed the hospitality gifts that I use today as a pastor's wife in my queer community. After my tenure book was written, I began writing my next one on the religious right and their politics of hatred against people like me. I considered you all members of the Liberty University community to be chief hate mongers that comprised this assault against me. You people simply terrified me, and truth be told, you sometimes still do. Twenty years ago, <laughs> it's all true, folks. Twenty years ago, I faced my fear of you by trying to write a book against you. And to write this book, I began reading the Bible. I took note that the Bible was an engaging literary display of every genre and trope and type. It had edgy poetry, deep and complex philosophy, and compelling narrative stories. But it also embodied a worldview that I hated. Sin, repentance, Sodom and Gomorrah? Totally absurd. Well, it, at this time, the men's movement, the Promise Keepers, they came to town. And they parked their little circus at the university. I was on a war against, well, I just called it stupid. And so I wrote an article, and I published it in the local newspaper. The article generated many rejoinders, so many that I kept boxes on each side of my desk, one for hate mail and one for fan mail. And one letter that I received, though, simply defied my filing system. It was from Pastor Ken Smith, the pastor of the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. And it was the kindest letter of opposition I have yet to this day ever received. And this really puzzled me. You see, I was suspicious of both the motives and the worldview that Christians espoused. I had seen my share of Bible verses on placards at gay pride marches, that Christians who protested against me and mocked me at gay pride day were happy that I and everyone I loved was going to hell was as clear as the sky is blue. But Ken's letter did not mock, it engaged. From his letter, Ken seemed different. So when he invited me to his home for dinner to discuss these matters more fully, I accepted. My motives at the time were clear. I thought this would be great for my research. I kind of thought of Ken Smith as my unpaid research assistant. But something else actually happened. Ken and his wife Floy and I became friends. They entered my world. They met my friends. We did book exchanges. We talked openly about sexuality and politics, and they did not act as if such conversations were polluting them. They did not treat me like a blank slate. And when we ate together, Ken prayed in a way that I had simply never heard before. His prayers were intimate, vulnerable. He repented of his sin in front of me. He thanked God for all things. Ken's God was holy and firm, and yet full of mercy. And at my first meal at their home, Ken and Floy omitted two important steps in the rule book of how Christians should deal with a heathen like me. Number one, and we all know the rule book, number one, they did not share the gospel with me. And number two, they did not invite me to church. 
I mean, I wondered, what am I, chopped liver? You know, everybody gets the, the, the call, right? But because of these omissions to the Christian rule book as I had come to know it, I felt that when Ken extended his hand to me in friendship, it was actually safe to close mine and his. You see, I was not Ken's project. I was Ken's neighbor. This was not friendship evangelism. This was friendship. I started meeting with Ken and Floyd regularly, reading the Bible in earnest with pen in hand and notebook in lap. I read the Bible the way I am trained to read a book, reading large segments of the Bible at a time, usually whole books, while fighting with its textual authority, its authorship, its canonicity, its internal hermeneutics. Slowly and over time, the Bible started to take on a life and a meaning that startled me. Some of my well-worn paradigms no longer stuck, and I had, I had to at least ponder the hermeneutical claim that this book really was different from all the others, because maybe, just maybe, it really was inspired by a holy God and inherently true and trustworthy. But I fundamentally rejected what I believed was the false simplicity of Christian logic, its doctrine of sin, and its belief that the Bible was God-breathed. Christians believe that because Jesus paid with his life for the sin of all those who repent and believe in him, we have Christ's power to flee even from unchosen sin. For the Bible records even unchosen sin as treason against God and punishable by death and hell. I noticed as I read the Bible that its admonitions about sin were offered by offers of grace. You know, I never saw that at placards at gay pride marches. And I noticed as I read the Bible that the God of the Bible deals differently with people when people dealt differently with God. But how, oh how, I wondered, would that system work for me? I didn't think I was hurting anyone. I believed I was living and being my authentic self. And I fully recoiled at the idea that being a lesbian was living in sin. I mean, who in her right mind would choose a God you cannot see over a lover you can? But if God is the creator of all things, and the Bible has his seal of truth and power, then it did seem logical to me that the Bible had the right to interrogate my life and my culture and not the other way around. You see, even as a postmodern professor, I understood the idea that authority can only depend on that which is higher than itself. I mean, I was a professor after all. If your paper was due on Friday and you didn't bother giving it to me until next Monday, it just wasn't gonna go so well for you. I mean, you may be very nice people. You may walk your dog and feed your plants and all that, but I just had more authority than you. <laughs> and so I wondered, who is higher than God? Well, my friends knew I was reading the Bible. And they also suspected it was becoming more than a research project for me. At a dinner gathering that my partner and I were hosting, my transgendered friend Jill cornered me in the kitchen. She put her large hand over mine and said, Rosaria, this Bible reading is changing you. Well, I felt exposed. She was right. She always was. And so I asked, Jill, what if it's true? What if Jesus is a real and risen Lord? What if we are all in trouble? Well, Jill exhaled deeply and she sat down in a chair across from mine and her eyes looked wise. And she said, Rosaria, I was a Presbyterian minister for 15 years. I prayed that God would heal me, but he did not. If you want, I will pray for you. Well. Now you know what gay rights activists actually do talk about in the kitchen. I'm not kidding. This encounter gave me a secret tacit permission to keep reading the Bible. After all, my dear friend Jill had also read it cover to cover many times and had rooted around in its deep crevices for life purpose and help and meaning. But I didn't believe that I needed healing. I believed that gay was good 
and valuable and ethical. Well, the next day when I returned home from work, I found two large milk crates spilling over with theological books, Jill's books from seminary. She was giving them to me. In Calvin's Institutes, in Jill's handwriting, was a warning. All it said was this, watch Romans 1. Well, I'd read the Bible a few times through, and that was one of the passages I kept skipping. (laughs) But you know how it is when a friend guides you. So I opened my Bible, and this is what I read. For even though they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, and of birds, and of four-footed animals, and crawling creatures. Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, and worshiped and served the creature rather than the Creator. And for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. Well, these verses seem to provide a haunting literary echo to Genesis 3, where Eve's desire to live independently of God's authority made perfect sense to me. The two literary frames, one in Genesis and one in Romans, stood out as the table of contents of what ails the world. Indeed, Romans 1 does not end by highlighting homosexuality as a morally neutral form of sexual orientation, or as a discrete and separate category of inherited personhood that many people believe it to be today. Instead, this passage finds its crescendo in how one sin, homosexuality, morphs into other sins. Quote, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them give hearty approval to those who practice them. This last line grabbed me by the throat. It told me that people who cannot receive a blessing from God will demand it from men. People of God, when after the Obergefell decision in 2015, you saw the White House lit up in a backdrop of the rainbow flag, You saw the manifestation of this verse. If you cannot receive a blessing from God, you will demand it from men. As the faculty advisor to many LGBTQ groups on campus, this really got my attention. But I also took note of the theological diagnosis. Homosexuality in the Bible is presented here as one step in the journey away from God's blessing and protection. The Bible condemns homosexuality as a verb, what some people do, and does not recognize it as a noun, who some people claim to be. You see, the world has accepted that the 19th century invention of sexual orientation as a category of personhood is an accurate category and a good marker of personal identity, but that's simply not how the Bible understands homosexuality. Homosexuality, from God's point of view, is an identity-rooted ethical outworking of this original sin. And therefore, it seemed solidly biblical to say that indeed some of us are born this way, because truth be told, we are all born in Adam. We are all born this way, this way distorted by original sin in one way or another. But by failing to rigorously relinquish my identity to God's story, and by failing to understand that the fall rendered even my deepest and most primal feelings untrustworthy and untrue, 
I had added to my ledger of original sin by creating for myself a category of personhood that God did not. God has one category of personhood. We are male and female image bearers of a holy God with a soul that will last forever. There simply is no biblical category of personhood subsumed under the 19th century category invention of sexual orientation. Instead, the Bible declares a Genesis 127 category of personhood. We are made in the image of God, and we have a sin orientation in Adam and a soul orientation in eternity. And once born again in Christ, a new citizenship, one that came in exchange for the life you loved and not in addition to it, in spite of believing, living, and teaching the idea that gender and sexuality were social constructs, the Bible made it clear to me that God has set ethical and moral responsibilities, blessings, and restraints for being born male or female. And I want you to know that when I speak on college campuses, both secular and Christian, what I just said in that last line is called hate speech. Well, I had taught, studied, read, and lived a very different notion of sexuality, and for the very first time in my life, I wondered if I was really wrong. I tried to toss the Bible and its teachings in the trash. The research program was, the research project was done, I didn't want to write the book, and I didn't want anything to do with Christians or the Bible. But Ken Smith had become my friend. And only because that, he, when he encouraged me to keep reading, because I trusted him, I did. Among other things, I was fighting with the idea that the Bible is inspired and inerrant. That is, that the biblical authors were moved by the Holy Spirit to record the Word of God, and that the Bible is completely true and without, without error. How could a smart cookie like me embrace such things? I didn't even believe in truth. I was a postmodernist. I believed in truth claims. I believed that the reader constructed the text, that a text's meaning found its power only in the reader's interpretation of it. Without a reader, a book is just paper and glue, I told my students over and over again. How dare this one book, the Bible, lay claim to a birthright and a progeny totally different than any other book on the planet. Well, after years and years of this, something happened. The Bible got to be bigger inside me than I. It overflowed into my world, and I fought against it with all my might. And then one Sunday morning, two years after I first met Ken and Floyd, and two years after I started reading the Bible for my research, I left the home I shared with my partner, and an hour later I sat in a pew at the Syracuse Reformed Presbyterian Church. I felt like a freak sitting there in church. I kept thinking about last year's Gay Pride March, wide as it was with people just like me, people who made me feel safe and loved, people I valued as family, when I crossed the threshold of the church door, I became a traitor to the people I loved most in the world. I kept going back to church to hear more sermons, and I started to make friendships with people in the church. I was perplexed by how they referenced the Bible in the details of their day. You know, English professors by training love textual cross-referencing, and the more direct quotes, the better. Um, and, and I like that about my Christian friends. They had a lot of good direct quotes. But I'll tell you, I muddled over this in my mind. Cross-referencing the Bible with your life places you inside God's story, inside God's ontology. Is this safe? Is this deadly? I sure knew it would have been deadly for me to do such crazy things. But I was noticing something else about my Christian friends. They were getting things out of the Bible that I simply wasn't. They were understanding how the Bible fit together as a whole. And they were fueled by a power, by a dynamism imparted by Jesus 
that I knew I simply had, I simply did not possess. Now, I had read the Bible seven times through at this point, and I really wondered, why couldn't I see what they did? Well, one Lord's Day, Ken was preaching through the Gospel of Matthew with its, and from a literary perspective, this is such a rich gospel, with its bewildering cast of characters and unsuspecting folks separated unto the gospel, wild metaphors, seeds choked by the world, feeding thousands with some poor and nameless kids bread and fish. I have always felt sorry for that poor guy. I have. (laughs) It's true. And then Jesus' cutting question to impetuous Peter, do you still lack understanding? Well, one Lord's Day, Pastor Ken Smith just stopped right there, and he, t- he held us in this agonizing pause. I mean, I-, I was kind of wondering, is that old guy having a heart attack behind the pulpit? And when do these, you know, when do the frozen chosen move to call the paramedics? But that's not what happened. <laughs> just a question. He held us in this long pause, but then he finally did speak, and this is what he said. He said, congregation, did Christ ever say this to you? Why can't you see the power of God? Is it because you still lack understanding? Well, this startled me. You see, this was my question. This question was for me. Why couldn't I see what they did? Do I still lack understanding? And for a split second, before I could shove down this rebuke, I thought this one horrifying thought. Who is speaking here? That old man behind the pulpit? Or the God-man behind the creation of the world and the redemption of his people? And the image that crashed like waves in a raging sea of me and everyone I loved suffering in hell vomited into my consciousness and gripped me in its teeth, not because we called ourselves gay, but because we were proud. We wanted to be autonomous. We rejected the Bible's interpretive authority over our sexuality, our sexual identity, and our sexual practice. You see, if the Bible was true, I was dead. And if the Bible is false, or only semi-true, or only true in the red letters, or only true when it resonates with my personal integrity or deepest feelings, or only true when it reinvents Jesus as my imaginary friend, then let me tell you what, people, you are staring at the biggest fool on earth. But God's promises rolled in like another round of waves into my world. And one Lord's Day, Pastor Ken was preaching on John 7, 17, if anyone wills to do God's will, he shall know concerning the doctrine. Well, this verse exposed the quicksand in which my feet were stuck. I was a thinker. I was paid to read books and write about them and tell you all what to think about them. And I expected that in all areas of my life, understanding would have to come before obedience, not the other way around. I wanted God to show me on my terms why homosexuality was a sin. I wanted to be the judge, not the one being judged. Perhaps I thought like Eve in the garden, I wanted to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so that I could become and replace God. And then I wondered, hadn't I already done this? Hadn't we all? If my consciousness fell in Adam's sin, as the Bible purports, There is no wonder I could not think my way out of this quandary. You see, this wasn't a game of thinking and the matching of wits. Could my heart echo God's call for obedience? Could I will to do God's will just this once? The stakes were so very high because they always are. But this verse promised understanding after obedience, and I wrestled with the question, did I really want to understand homosexuality from God's point of view, or did I just want to argue with Him? I prayed that night that God would give me the willingness to obey before I understood. I prayed that God would be pleased to reveal His Son in me. I prayed that I would be a vessel of Jesus. And then I moved to gender, and I don't know why. 
but I had a growing desire to make biblical sense of my place in the world as a woman defined by and covered by God. And so I prayed that God would make me a godly woman, and then I laughed out loud at the total insanity of that prayer. <laughs> I left that night of prayer pondering one question. Could original sin be for real? And could it really distort me like this? Is my sexual love for women a reflection of the real me or a distortion of it through original sin? Who am I, I wondered. I felt like a lesbian in my body and my heart. But if Jesus could split the world asunder, divide the soul and the spirit, judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart, could he make my true identity prevail? Who will God have me to be? I still felt like a lesbian. That, that was my flesh's identity. It was well practiced. But what is a Christian identity, I wondered. You know, the Bible makes clear that the fallen flesh and a redeemed mind have a troubled relationship on this side of eternity. For many people in the Bible, their redeemed identity and calling comes only after a long struggle with God, with wilderness and with dreams and hopes and plans dashed and destroyed. What will become of me if Jesus takes over? The cross is ruthless. The cross makes no ally with the sin it crushes in the death and resurrection of the Lord. And what if I commit my life to Christ, I wondered, and my lesbian feelings never disappear? Does that mean that God does not love me or hear me or care? Is the gospel bad news for people who identify on the LGBTQ continuum? Who is this Jesus? Did I know him? Did I still lack understanding? Could I trust him? And then, one ordinary day, I came to Jesus. I was in church, and we were singing from Psalm 119. When the line, this has become mine, came out of my mouth, I startled. You see, I had just sung condemnation unto myself, and I was actually in tune enough with the Holy Spirit to feel his convicting rebuke. This Bible was not mine. Oh, I had read it plenty times through. I had studied it a lot. I know that. But I had also scorned it and cursed it and despised it, and I taught thousands of college students to do the same. But I had read the Bible many times through, and I saw for myself that it really did have a holy author. I saw for myself that it really was a canonized collection of 66 books with a unified biblical revelation. And I heard for myself that when the phrase, this has become mine, came out of my mouth in congregational singing, I was attesting to this one simple truth, that the line of communication that God ordained for his people required this wrestling with scripture and that I truly wanted to both hear God's voice breathed into my life, and I wanted God to hear my pleas. The fog burned away, the whole Bible, each jot and each tittle, was my open highway to a holy God. My hands let go of the wheel of self-invention. I came to Jesus alone, open-handed and naked. I had no dignity upon which to stand. As an advocate for peace and social justice, I thought I was on the side of kindness, integrity, diversity, compassion, and care. It was thus a crushing revelation to discover it. It was Jesus I had been persecuting the whole time. Not just some historical figure named Jesus, but my Jesus, my prophet, my priest, my king, my savior, my redeemer, my friend, that Jesus. Well, of course, there is only one thing to do when you meet the living God. You must fall on your face and repent of your sins. I started by repenting of my pride, the pride that led me to believe that I could invent my own rules for faith and life and sexual autonomy. The pride that said that I was entitled to live separately from God or reinvent God on my terms. The pride that led me to believe that self-worth was self-invented. 
Repentance is the daily posture of the Christian and the threshold to a holy God. Repentance is the only no-shame solution to a renewed Christian conscience because it proves the obvious, that God was right all along. Conversion did not immediately change my sexual desires for women. You see, I was not converted out of homosexuality. I was converted out of unbelief. The gospel comes in exchange for the life you love, not in addition to it. Gospel life. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Gospel life is a cross-bearing life, and same-sex attraction for many believers is a cross to bear. I choose my words carefully here, friends, and there is a worldview of difference between bearing the cross of same-sex attraction and claiming the false identity of a gay Christian. If you are listening today and you are experiencing unchosen same-sex attraction and you are battling this sin in God's way, forsaking the false identity of gay Christianity and the alphabet soup of LGBTQ activism for the true identity of image bearer of a holy God, forsaking through grace any sexual expression that God calls sin, embracing chastity in singleness and fidelity in marriage, and what my friend and author Christopher Yuan calls holy sexuality, then you, agonizing struggle and all, are simply a hero. You are a hero of the faith. God pledges to you his kind company and power in the midst of this struggle. He does not promise, however, that struggle with sin will disappear fully until glory. As you stand in the risen Christ alone in this battle, you should not be shunned or despised or demeaned, but rather embraced as a brother and sister in Christ, as a decorated soldier standing in robes of righteousness, hearing your Father's words, beloved son, beloved daughter, in you I am well pleased. For me, something else happened after I crossed the threshold into faith in Christ. My prayer to be a godly woman morphed into another desire, to be a godly wife. Now let me say, it, say loud and clear, biblical marriage is not a gospel requirement. I believe that there is a vital and powerful role for singles in the church, and that singleness in Christ is neither selfishness nor secondhand gospel citizenship. Singles are simply not people who need to be fixed or fixed up. But nonetheless, I felt called, if God willed, to ask God to make me a godly wife, to work in me such that I could be a helper in all aspects of my life to a godly man. And a year later, I met my husband, Kent Butterfield, and we have been joyfully married for 15 years. My role as Kent's helper and the mother of our children is my daily witness that we serve a God who lives, who hears our prayers, who loves his people, and who carries the heavier part of the cross we bear on this earth. The crosses that the Lord meets out are not democratic. In this room, some of you are bearing ten crosses. And some of you are bearing one. And each cross is tailor-made to prepare each one of us for eternity, where we will judge the angels someday and stand in robes of righteousness. Yes, 
There is agony, but the greatest agony ever experienced, the most profound mind-body assault was experienced by our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ on behalf of His people. 2 Corinthians 5.21 records this, for our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Not one tear that you shed in the struggle for holiness will ever be wasted. Not one hardship of yours will ever be for naught. Yes, the gospel is always costly, and the gospel is always worth it. Thank you. standing, join me in prayer. <laughs> our great God and our Heavenly Father, we love you and we need your help. Oh God, we live amidst so much confusion and so much raging confusion in our own hearts, and yet you have called us to steward the gospel for this watching world. Oh God, help us. Make us better, Lord. We thank you that you, in your love, in your atoning love, bore down on the malice of devils and the betrayal of friends. And oh God, we stand in the risen Christ alone. Equip us, Lord, and may we see a revival in this land. And oh God, please help us, help us to cherish the heartbreak of our friends. In the matchless and the mighty name of Jesus we pray, and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Dr. Butterfield, thank you so much. Was she not phenomenal, you all? Yeah. Well, I just want to remind you all that the, uh, the LU Shepherds are over here to my left should you guys need prayer or ministry. But other than that, you guys are dismissed. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend.